This is David Bergantino, author of the Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror series. You're listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian's audiobook presentation of Virtual Terror. Keep it scary out there. Hey Slashaholics, this is the 80s Slasher Librarian. Be sure to check out and join the Facebook group page, follow the channel on Twitter and Instagram, and also check out the merch store and the Patreon page. Uh, the links to all of these are in the description below. Uh, just let you know, I depend on horror fans like you to keep this channel going and growing for years to come. Cannot monetize the channel due to the content and the copyrights surrounding it. So the Patreon is what keeps the channel funded. You can sign up and support the channel for as low as $2 per month. You get some great rewards depending on the tier you select. You get early access to certain content. A weekly exclusive podcast only on Patreon. You can also voice characters and audiobook narrations. You can get free merch, free ebooks, and so much more. Check out the Patreon page and sign up today for as low as two bucks. Really use your support, and you'll be helping this channel keep going and growing for a long time to come. Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror, by David Bergantino. Chapter 6. Keith froze. Acting purely on instinct, Mario elbowed him sharply in the ribs. Keith went down, clutching his side and gasping for breath. When Mario realized what he'd done, he almost instantly forgot about the fight. Rising to help Keith, he turned his back on Scrag who staggered to his feet and prepared to take advantage of the distraction. But just as he was about to sucker punch Mario, Sandra stopped him. That's enough, she screamed. Seeing her, he dropped his arms to his side and just stood there, breathing heavily from exertion. What's going on? Sandra demanded. Why don't you ask pretty boy here? He said between gasps. Blood trickled from the side of his mouth. His eyes glimmered devilishly as he nodded toward Mario. Mario, kneeling beside Keith, replied with an equally malevolent look. I'll get back to you in a minute. Then he turned back to Keith. You okay, dude? I'm great, he groaned, positive that Mario had broken several ribs. I didn't know it was you, Mario insisted. I'm sorry. It's okay. I wasn't going to wrestle this week anyway. Keith choked out before a spasm of painful coughing hit him. Pam and Carrie joined Mario at his side, their faces wrought with concern. Don't, don't worry, he told them. I'll live. Ugh. He tried to sit up, but the pain forced him back. A harsh adult voice suddenly commanded everyone's attention. The police will be here in three minutes, yelled Mr. Willis, manager of the coffee shop. Anyone who doesn't want to be arrested better be gone in two. He made his announcement to the entire crowd, but his eyes were fixed on Scrag. The gawkers quickly began to disperse. I think we'd better get out of here, kidlets, Sandra told the group. Scrag winced as he felt his jaw. Come on, baby, she said to him. Yeah, Scrag said, his eyes fixed on Mario. Gotta get you away from that creep. You're not safe. Mario stood quickly. Pam and Carrie jumped up to hold him back. Scrag smirked at him, then started to laugh. Shut up and come on, Sandra told him and pulled him away. I'll see you guys tomorrow, she said to the rest of them and led Scrag to his car. Soon, the roar of Scrag's souped-up Mustang drowned out all other sounds. 
With the screech and a blue cloud of exhaust, the car tore out of the parking lot. By now, Keith had made it to his feet. His chest still hurt, but he felt no telltale grinding, no broken ribs. Are you going to be okay to drive? Pam asked. I think so, he answered, not really sure. His arm wouldn't move without causing pain to flare in his side. Tell you what, Mario said. Pam, you drive Keith's car to his house. I'll follow behind you and give you a ride from there. That okay with you, Keith? Yeah, yeah, fine. Good, let's go. I think our time is almost up. Police sirens blared in the distance. The group split up and Keith gave Pam his car keys. He was glad not to drive. He hurt in more places than his chest. His hand wasn't doing that well and his headache had never gone away. He was surprised that his head had not burst open the moment he'd recognized Scrag's face from the poster. Too many images, too many questions were crammed into his skull right now. After pulling out of the wide-awake parking lot, Pam waited at a light in front of the coffee shop. The place had returned to normal very quickly. Most of the sidewalk tables were filled once again with groups of teens. They chattered animately, probably recounting the scene they had just witnessed. One table, Keith noticed, was occupied by only one person. He looked very detached from the other patrons. Not only did he not belong, he appeared uncomfortably aware of that fact. Then Keith saw that the person was looking at him, staring. The light changed and the car started moving. All at once, Keith recognized Mel, the cashier at the Virtual Illusions cart. Mel flashed Keith a creepy smile as the car passed. Then he nodded slightly and winked as if they were sharing a secret. Before Keith could make sense of Mel's gestures, they drove out of sight. Keith settled back in his seat and let his breath out with a groan. You hurting? Pam asked. In reply, Keith started whistling. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. When they arrived at Keith's house, his mother's car was in the driveway, but the house was dark. He figured, hoped, she had gone to bed. Just as well, he thought. At the rate I'm collecting injuries, I might as well wait a few days and explain everything to her at one time. Mario pulled in behind Keith's car and he got out with Carrie. I'm sorry again, dude. Mario seemed ready to apologize. Ad infinitum. I'm okay, Keith insisted. But the least you could do is be hurt yourself. You're the one who got in the fight. I don't even see any blood. Carrie wiped it off in the car, Mario grinned. Of course, it was Scrag's blood. He winked at Keith and turned to Pam. Let's get you home. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, Keith. Pam gave him a peck on the cheek and started to get into Mario's back seat. Hold on, said Carrie. I'll be right there. As Mario joined Pam in the car, Carrie approached Keith. What a great reacquainted date, huh? She said. Classic, he replied laughing. Really? I'm glad we went out. Whatever happened, I think it'll be easy after this. Yeah, me too. Take, take some Advil and get some sleep, she told him. Then she awkwardly held out her hand. He reached for it, then drew her into a quick embrace. They had not hugged in months. It felt good. I'll be fine, he told her. I'll see you at school. Good night. Carrie returned to Mario's car and Keith watched his friends pull out moments later. Keith went up to his room to prepare for bed. He expected that the pain in his body would keep him awake, but worse than that, his racing thoughts outpaced his need for sleep. He replayed the day's events over and over, always returning to Mysteria and its image of scrag and terrible pain. The poster's eerie presence again permeated the room, as if a sinister invisible light emanated from it in the darkness. Oh, this is all real, it was telling him in a smooth, dark voice. And this is only the beginning. The evil droning continued on and on, eventually lulling Keith into sleep.
Keith woke up with a start, catapulted from a nightmare. He remembered nothing except for an image of Mel smiling eerily and waving at him, as he had that evening. Keith looked across the room toward Mysteria, which hung shrouded in the darkness of his room. Whatever Keith had felt from it earlier was gone, if it had been there at all. Or maybe whatever strange energy the poster possessed was simply dormant for now. Waiting. That brought him back to the Virtual Illusions cashier once more. He wondered if Mel, who professed a belief in invisible forces, had perceived anything strange about the poster. Maybe that's why he had been so anxious to get rid of it. Suddenly, Keith was very curious to ask Mel some questions. Checking his clock, Keith found that only an hour had passed. Conceivably, Mel might still be at the coffee shop. That possibility stoked Keith's curiosity, and he quickly made up his mind. He had to try to find out more about the poster tonight. Mel's strange smile flashed in his mind again. Yes, Keith realized, he knows something. Keith got out of bed and dressed quickly. He left the house as quietly as he could and got to his car. His only fear was that the sound of the engine starting would awaken his mother. As he pulled out of the driveway, he watched her bedroom window for a light. It remained dark. As he drove away, he realized that she might just now be reaching for the light switch. If she did wake up and found him gone, he'd be in big trouble when he returned later. Oh well, he'd deal with it. In the meantime, he had other things to worry about. Back at Wide Awake, Keith found Mel still sitting at the same table. When Keith approached, Mel seemed pleasantly surprised. Hey man, have a seat, he said, pointing to the empty chair opposite him. What are you doing here? Couldn't sleep. Wondered if you were still here, Keith said as he pulled out the chair and sat down. You were looking for me? Cool. Mel seemed genuinely surprised and flattered. Good thing you came when you did. I was about out of here. So what's up? I wanted to ask you about the poster you sold me. Keith watched Mel stiffen slightly. Did it ever make you feel weird or anything? Mel's face had become a blank. What do you mean? He asked evenly. I mean when you touched it or looked at it. Mel regarded him curiously as if Keith were putting him on. But then he realized Keith was serious. He shook his head. Nope, I didn't notice anything. Why? He sat forward, obviously intrigued by Keith's question. I know this is going to sound strange, Keith told him. But I don't know. It gives me a bad feeling. A thoughtful, hmm, was Mel's only reply. Keith forged ahead. And tonight, I saw a face on it, he said. And the really weird thing is, I knew who it was, too. This guy, Scrag. Keith stopped when another eerie smile lit up Mel's face. The guy your buddy was fighting tonight, Mel told him. You know him? Oh, yes, Mel admitted, smiling as if Keith had caught him with his hand in the proverbial cookie jar. I came here tonight to meet him. We had a little, uh, business to transact. He chuckled to himself. But the fight messed that up. I just decided to hang out and watch people. I just love watching people. So, Keith realized, Mel was one of Scrag's customers. That explained an awful lot. But before Keith could think about it any further, Mel returned to the subject of the poster. So, you saw Scrag's face in Mysteria, huh? He was darkly amused. Freaky. Especially the way he looked, Keith explained. I think he was being tortured or something. He was definitely screaming. Keith braced himself for a burst of derisive laughter from Mel, but Mel did not laugh. Instead, his eyes lit up gleefully. Tortured, huh? He said dreamily, staring off into space. Apparently, he liked the idea of Scrag being tortured. So, you want to know what I think? Yes, Keith said anxiously. Mel's reaction had been strange, unnerving, but this was why Keith had come back tonight. To tell you the truth, I think you just don't like Scrag too much and you're projecting your feelings or something like that. Keith's expectations were shattered. When Mel noticed Keith's disappointment, he asked, But you think something else is going on? Keith tried to make him understand. 
I wasn't even thinking of Scrag, it just happened. I thought you understood weird phenomena. This hit Mel where he lived, and for the first time he seriously considered Keith's problems. Okay, let's say you did see the face in the poster. It still could be you. Keith started to protest, but Mel continued. Or it could be a combination of you and the poster. I've heard all sorts of things that fit what you say, and only a few of them mean you're nuts. He laughed to show Keith he was kidding. Anyway, on the one hand, the poster could be acting like a, a TV or something, showing you pictures. Or the poster could be reflecting what you see in your head, like a, like a psychic mirror. Finally, Keith was getting what he had come for. But I've never had an experience like this before, he pointed out. Well, that's where the poster comes in. Some people need catalysts to trigger their abilities. Happens all the time, from what I've read. You know, like witches had familiars and all that. Either way, Scrag's image in the poster could mean something. But what? Keith wondered aloud. Usually it's a warning. I'd say something bad is going to happen to Scrag. Mel seemed quite sure. If he were a friend, I'd warn him if I were you. Then his voice became low and sinister. But Scrag's not a friend, is he? No, Keith said, his fear rising. But, but... Mel interrupted him by laughing. <laughs> I'm only playing with you, man. Keith didn't respond. Mel's erratic behavior was getting to him. Mel saw that he wasn't amused and tried to be more serious. Look, there's nothing you can do. How could you call Scrag up to tell him he's in danger? How would you explain his face in the poster? He'd think you were nuts. In any case, I wouldn't tell anyone about this. Why not? Keith asked. Mel answered with the question. Do your friends think you're strange? The mischievous glow was gone from his eyes. Probably, Keith answered, sure that it must be true to some extent. But do they treat you like a weirdo? Of course not. Why? Mel had shifted gears on him again. And what about other people? Acquaintances? How do they treat you? He seemed on the verge of some great revelation. I guess everyone treats me normally, Keith told him. What are you getting at? See, I thought so, he said, gesturing emphatically with his coffee cup. No offense, but I think you're strange. I don't know something about you, but I... I treat you normal too, don't I? I guess so, Keith answered suspiciously. Start spouting off about seeing faces in a poster and they're going to stop treating you like a normal person. That's what happened to me. Mel saw Keith's baffled expression and explained. See, when I was in high school, I was an outcast. I know, big surprise. Okay, so... I did some drugs then, too, but the thing is, people treated me like I came from another planet. People like you and your friends. <laughs> of course, not like you and your friends, because from what I've seen, you seem like good people. Then he frowned. Your buddy's a little scary, but he's probably okay, too. But anyway, I got treated like a goon so much, no matter how I acted after that. People still treated me like a goon, so eventually I became one. But sometimes I wonder, if the other students hadn't treated me like that, would I be that weird today? He paused and nodded slightly. You know what I'm getting at? If it's a problem, Keith asked less than sympathetically, why don't you just stop acting weird? Mel threw his hands up in resignation. It's too late. I'm me already. <sighs> he sighed, leaning his chin on his hands. He seemed to become depressed. Then he shook it off and smiled. All I'm saying is, if you tell your friends this stuff, then they'll start treating you like a weirdo, and next thing you know, you'll end up like me. This time, Keith was able to laugh. Listen, if it'll make you feel better, I'll see what I can find out about Mysteria. Who knows, maybe something wacky's going on. That'd be a kick, huh? Stop by the push cart later this week. I will, Keith replied. 
thanks. I, I'll probably wake up tomorrow and feel like an idiot for telling you all this. Nah, don't sweat it, Mel said as he rose from the table. But I gotta go now. I'll catch you later. Keith left shortly after Mel. The guy was definitely unique, he thought, and strange. But he decided Mel wasn't so creepy after all. Pulling into his driveway, Keith found the house as dark as when he'd left. His mother hadn't awakened after all. This contributed to Keith's sense of relief until he approached his bedroom door. After his talk with Mel, he didn't know how he'd react to the poster if it started sending out weird signals again. Or worse, produced another inexplicable image. He turned the knob slowly and pushed the door open. Entering the room, he faced Mysteria. The poster appeared utterly harmless. Keith relaxed again and changed for bed. Sleep came easily this time and lasted, unmarred by nightmares, until his alarm woke him for school in the morning. Chapter 7 Scrag Morton floated up from sleep unwillingly as a dream about two particularly vivacious double mint twins faded to black. As he awoke, his last sleep sensation was that of incredibly fresh breath. He immediately tried to reclaim the dream but could not make it back to the beach where they lay in the sun. Instead, he was in bed in the dark. An engine revved loudly nearby and the smell of exhaust assaulted his nose. He tried to sit up but couldn't seem to move. His entire body ached and when he turned his head toward the clock, his bruised jaw exploded with fireworks. He was just able to make out the time, 3.30 a.m. The pain reminded Scrag of his fight with Mario. He had punched the kid's buttons too hard that time and the kid had punched back with his fists well, he blew it, thought Scrag. Before the fight, he had told Mario's secret to no one. Afterward, he had told Sandra, because she demanded an explanation. But as of tomorrow, the whole school would know. The cat would be out of the bag entirely and scratching in the litter box. After dropping Sandra back at the coffee shop so she could pick up her car, he'd return to the ramshackle Elm Street house he rented. He had celebrated the trouble he was about to cause with a six-pack of beer, or two, he couldn't quite remember, and fallen asleep. Some would call it passing out, but he liked to think of it as hard sleep. Recalling the evening had almost put Scrag back to sleep. But outside, the engine roared again, and this time the sound brought him fully awake. It was the engine of his own beloved Mustang. Someone was stealing it. He tried to get out of bed, but found he couldn't move. Originally, he had thought his sore, stiff muscles were restricting his movement. Now, it felt like he was tied down. In the dim light, he could see bungee cords wrapped around his wrist and ankles, tethering him to the bedpost. He struggled against them, but could not escape. Hey, what's going on? Hey, he yelled. The engine revved even higher and drowned out his voice. He shouted a few choice swear words, but those two were lost in the engine's roar. Exhaust billowed in from the window above Scrag's head. The fumes were so strong he started to choke. Much more and he'd suffocate. The engine settled into a rumbling idle. The exhaust thinned out and Scrag could breathe again. He waited to hear the car pulling away, the engine noise fading as it drove down the street, but nothing happened. It merely sat there idling. If the car wasn't being stolen, then what was going on, he wondered, and why was he tied up? Fear suddenly pulled him under like a riptide. Hey! he yelled. Is somebody there? A car door opened, then slammed shut. Scrag listened. He heard strange noises, but he couldn't identify the source. Some scraping, clicking, a cord of some kind sliding over metal. Then, just outside the window, two sharp clicks, each accompanied by a crackling sound. Bright orange sparks darted into the room and fell. The flow faded as they landed. Hey! Scrag started to yell again, 
but stopped when something sharp bit into his left ear. Now he was screaming in pain, struggling against his bonds. It felt as if his ear had been torn off. His eyes flicked to the left, but all he could see was darkness. The pain was excruciating. Suddenly, a strong gloved hand grabbed his forehead. Then his scream was choked off as a second gloved hand thrust a coppery-tasting object into his mouth. A spiked vice clenched his tongue. Looking down, he saw a large plastic V shape extending from his mouth. A red plastic sheath cord ran from the shape and out of his sight through the window. The thick smoke of burning flesh rose from his mouth. His screams became nothing but pathetic gargles. Scrag knew what was happening to him. The revving of his car's finely tuned engine was the last sound Richard Scrag Morton heard as his brain surged with electricity. Chapter 8 Has anybody seen Sandra? Carrie asked as she approached Keith and Pam at lunch the next day. No, Keith told her. Why? Well, Mario wouldn't tell me what he and Scrag were fighting about yesterday. I was hoping Scrag had told her something. Did he tell either of you? Keith and Pam shook their heads no. Carrie pulled up a chair next to Keith. I just have this weird feeling today. I don't know what it is. Pam nodded seriously. I'm feeling the same way. I thought I was coming down with a cold or something, but it's not me. It's something else. Keith shrugged, feeling nothing wrong. In fact, he had felt great when he woke up that morning. Even his embarrassment for last night's strange obsession with the poster didn't bother him much. Just then, the doors to the cafeteria burst open, and Mario came running up to their table. You guys are not gonna believe this, he gasped out of breath. Scrag's dead. Pam went white. Oh my god! Worse than that, he was murdered. Someone Scrag Scrag. Mario could not hide the glee in his voice. He sat down heavily next to Carrie. And listen to how they did it. Hooked him up to his own car battery with jumper cables and fried the sucker. Oh no! cried Carrie. She was close to tears. My bet is some drug deal went down bad, and they cooked his goose, but for real. How can you talk like that? Carrie demanded of Mario. Someone died. So what that you didn't like him? You don't have to enjoy what happened. Tears streamed down her face. She rose quickly from the table and ran from the cafeteria. Mario swore to himself. Sorry, guys. We'll be right back. He left the table to follow Carrie. Keith? Pam's voice floated to him as if from a great distance. Keith, what's wrong? Panic edged her voice. The moment Mario had announced Scrag's murder, Keith had gone into shock. He had known. The poster had told him what was going to happen. And even how. The V-shaped object he now realized had been the jumper cable handle. He had known and done nothing. Keith's unconsciousness retreated to a far corner of his mind, fleeing the implications of what and how he had known. He felt pressure on his shoulder and was shaken roughly. Then he heard a voice, Pam's voice, loud and close to his ear. Keith, the police are here! They're taking Mario away! That broke Keith's stasis and he returned. The cafeteria rotated crazily around him, then clicked into proper orientation. He reached up and placed his hand over Pam's. She pointed out the cafeteria windows. They ran over and looked out on the parking lot. Mario was not handcuffed, but two police officers walked closely on either side of him. One opened the back door of a squad car and motioned for Mario to get in. Key threw open a window and called Mario's name. He caught only a glimpse of his friend's face as the officer closed the door. In that moment, Keith saw fear and desperation. The police ignored Keith's shout as well as the shouts of the other students. The officers climbed into the squad car and drove away. What happened? Keith asked Pam. 
After Mario walked away, the police stopped him at the entrance to, to the cafeteria. I guess they asked him to come with them? Her words were delivered between sobs. I thought you were paying attention, but you were... I don't know, gone. Completely gone. What's happening, Keith? Pam was at a total loss. I don't know, he replied. But where's Carrie? We have to find her. Right, said Pam, straightening up. I'll check the restroom. Pam found her there, and within minutes the three reconvened in the cafeteria. It's because of the fight last night, she told them. Everybody saw it. Could they really suspect him, though? Pam asked wide-eyed. I guess, but getting into a fight and cold-blooded murder are two different things, she said. Besides, we all know Mario. He wouldn't do something like that. The police will figure this out. They're not that dumb. Except for one thing, Keith said hesitantly. You remember where he comes from and how he was when he got here. For all we know, he may have a record. Carrie turned to him suddenly fierce. What do you mean by that? We don't know that he has a record. Right, but that's because he won't talk about his past. Maybe it's something he's been hiding. In that case, we have to do something, Carrie concluded. I can call my dad, Pam offered. He can get Mario a good lawyer. He knows lots of lawyers. Great, said Keith. I mean, he probably won't need a lawyer. They'll ask him some questions and then let him go. But you never know. I'm cutting the rest of the day, Carrie announced. I'm going to go down to the police station and keep a vigil. You guys coming? I'll go with you, Pam told her. I can call my father from there. Come with us, Keith. I'll meet you there, he told them. They started to protest, surprised that there could be anything more important than rushing down to the police station, but they didn't know about the poster, and he couldn't tell them. Even if he did, they wouldn't understand. Trust me, there's something I have to check on. It's important. They asked for an explanation, but he refused to give one. Finally, they let him go. In a few minutes, the bell rang, ending the lunch period. Pam left with Carrie, and Keith went off on his own. Minutes later, Keith arrived at the mall in search of Mel. He had to tell him what had happened. Mel would have to take him seriously now, and they had to work together to figure out what to do with the poster. But when Keith arrived at the Virtual Illusions pushcart, Mel was not there. Instead, he found a perky female college student tending the cash register. Excuse me, he said, out of breath from rushing. Is, is Mel coming in today? The scary guy with the dark circles under his eyes? She asked, wrinkling her nose. Keith nodded. He got fired, never came into work this morning, and the owner said he was stealing money, too. Damn, Keith swore, stomping the ground in frustration. Tell me about it, whined the new cashier. I have to pull a double shift now. Do you know how I can reach him? He asked. Nope, she told him. His phone has been disconnected. No forwarding number. The owners are looking for him. He's in big trouble. Keith stood quietly for a moment, fighting the urge to yell. He tried to think of what to do. Nothing came to him. His shoulders sagged in resignation. He had no way of finding Mel, and Mel had no way of contacting him. And under the circumstances, Mel might have skipped town. Keith thanked the cashier and returned to his car. He drove straight to the police station. Pam and Carrie ran to him as soon as he arrived. They told him that the police had been talking to Mario for almost an hour. Pam's father had promised to find a lawyer, but no one had arrived yet. While they filled him in, Keith noticed Mario's aunt sitting on a nearby bench. She stared straight ahead. At the sound of Keith's voice, she turned toward him. Her expression was one of anger and disillusionment but it didn't seem to be directed toward him. After acknowledging his presence with a slight nod, she went back to staring straight ahead. Keith went over to her. Mrs. Vasquez? he asked. She looked up at him solemnly. 
Mario's father will be very disappointed, she said. He didn't do anything, Mrs. Vasquez, Keith told her. I meant he'll be disappointed with me. Mario's father never had any illusions about his son. It was I who thought things would be better if he came to Springwood. But Mario has not changed. She shook her head, deeply ashamed. Mario's a good guy, Mrs. Vasquez, he told her reassuringly. He hasn't done anything wrong. With that, Mario's aunt fixed Keith with an icy stare. Of course he has, she told him harshly. Why do you think they've held him for so long? No doubt they discovered that Mario is a criminal. She paused, letting this information sink in. If I had not begged his father to send him to me, Mario would have been in jail long ago for murder. What do you mean, Mrs. Vasquez? Carrie asked, stunned at the revelation. Mario has a temper, but he'd never kill anyone. Mrs. Vasquez shook her head slowly. Then she said, But dear, he already has. Nobody could speak. Mrs. Vasquez's eyes were dead. She was serious, utterly serious. A door opened before anyone could say another word. Two policemen escorted Mario out to the waiting area. His face was gray with fear. Mrs. Vasquez, thank you for coming down. We're sorry for the inconvenience. The officer stopped, allowing Mario to walk forward. His three friends immediately surrounded him. Carrie gave him a hug. Mrs. Vasquez stood but did not go to her nephew. Instead, she turned toward the policeman who had addressed her. Will you need to see him again? She asked quietly. Hard to say at this point. He's not in any trouble. Let me make that clear. But we may need to speak to him again. He seemed sincere. Keith glanced at Mrs. Vasquez to see if the news affected her. It did not. Her expression remained grave. He will be available, Mrs. Vasquez told the officer. Come with me, Mario. He went to her side without a word. She turned and started out the door. Mario quickly mouthed the words, Call me. The other three teenagers nodded, then watched Mario fall into step next to his aunt. What was that all about? asked Pam. I don't know, Carrie said. But I just don't buy that Mario is a murderer. Me neither, agreed Pam. Keith nodded his head and hoped the others would accept that as agreement on his part. But in truth, he wasn't sure. Something terrible had happened in Mario's past. He could tell by Mrs. Vasquez's eyes, and by the way Mario wouldn't talk about his life before Springwood. But the poster had shown him Scrag's death before it had happened. And before that, his nightmare had shown him a violently out-of-control Mario. Could his dream be as accurate as his vision in the poster? He hoped not, but he really didn't know what to believe. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror by David Bergantino. Got a lot of stuff to unpack here, kind of wind down, do a little discussion here about what we just read, what you guys just heard. Um, first off, uh, the fight was, you know, I don't know what's going on with these guys. I wish we had more backstory, but the fight was pretty cool. Uh, I was right. Uh, Keith made a mistake sneaking up and trying to break up the fight. Got an elbow to the ribs. Uh, got winded pretty good there. Uh, I'm surprised Mario didn't just turn around and pop, pop him in the face. Uh, you know, I had friends like that. If you try to get in on their fights, you'd, you'd get you'd get punched, uh, whether you were their best friend or not, because they weren't paying attention. They were just in fight mode. Um, so, yeah, pretty interesting there. Uh, it seems like Scrag had some information on Mario, but was that information about Mario's past with the other murder thing, or was it something else entirely? 
You know, and did Mario kill him? Or did Mel kill him? Or did Carrie or Pam? Or maybe Keith in his sleep? You know, this is just, I have no leads right now. Uh, I don't want to go with the obvious thing and say Mario did kill Scrag, because that's too obvious. It's too on the nose. Um, but let's talk about uh, the death scene, our first death of the book, and that's poor old Scrag. I gotta say, the way he went was pretty brutal. Waking up in bed, tied to the bedpost, you know, all the bedpost, and he's hearing his engine revving up. You know, I thought they were gonna, like, uh, you know, kill him with the exhaust. You know, that's what I thought was coming. Like, I was really expecting the killer to, like, stick a pipe in his no in his mouth, <clears throat> or a hose in his mouth, and, you know, just pump the uh, exhaust in. Um, but, you know, they get electrocuted, the jumper cable thing, wow. That was fucking brutal. Uh, pardon my French there, but damn, that was fucking brutal. Um, but before that, the scraping on the car and the sparks, that screams of Freddy's glove. You know, maybe. Uh, I don't want to jump to conclusions again. Uh, that's why I didn't put a sound effect of Freddy's glove, because I don't know for sure. This is my first time reading it. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm suspecting. So maybe maybe whoever's possessed by Freddy or whatever has access to his glove. That would be a pretty cool thing. I don't know. David, if you're listening, I know I'm probably just so amusing to you, like trying to guess all this story, uh, uh, you know, halfway through the book. Um, but yeah, I'm really enjoying this book, and I hope you all are too. I gotta admit that Carrie and Pam, <clears throat> their reaction to, to hearing Scrag's death and then Mario's arrest, it just... I didn't realize that they were this good of friends and stuff and that good of a couple. Uh, but yeah, their emotions were really heightened in that scene. Um, you know, Keith figuring out that he saw Scrag's death and did nothing about it. That right there is a big weight to carry. Um, to carry on his shoulders. And uh, I can only imagine, you know, so I could really feel that scene when he heard Scrag died. I can really feel that scene as he's like zoning out and thinking those thoughts. You know, I knew and I didn't do anything. And uh, the backstory when we get to the police station that Mario has killed before or been accused of murder. Wow, did not see that coming. Uh, but I'm curious to see where that goes. The aunt seems kind of like kind of a bitch, you know, like not having any faith in her nephew at all. It's like, if you have no faith in him, why are you looking after him to begin with? Um, but that's a good characterization, good character writing. Uh, David's real good at that. Uh, and here's the part I was saving for the end, of the end of the discussion. I really enjoyed the scene <clears throat> after the fight when the police came. Everybody left, and Keith fell asleep, woke up, and went back to the cafe to talk to Mel. First and foremost, I am loving getting to voice Mel. And, uh, you know, I'm really enjoying playing his character and acting it out. And I hope you guys are enjoying my my portrayal of Mel, because I I'm really invested into making this character the way I'm feeling him, and I'm trying to act him out and do voice acting for him really well. And I hope that's coming across. Uh, but the conversation was creepy as hell, and you know this guy's all over the place, and I really feel like he is connected to the end of this book. I don't know if he's the one that's possessed by Freddy or if he is Freddy or what, but I feel like Mel, even though he got fired and he's on the run or whatever, he's still got a very big part to play. I don't think we've seen the last of him. I hope we haven't because I'm really excited. I really enjoy playing him, um, you know. But him sitting there telling all this stuff to Keith about his own past, and you know, we did find out in that scene that he has a connection to Scrag. So, I mean, maybe it was Mel that killed Scrag. It's like David does such a good job with the suspects because we've got we've got we've got suspects. Now, you know, we got a handful. Of, we've got Scrag and Mario for sure, but what about Carrie? What about Pam? You know, they could be they could be double agents here. Um so yeah, I'm really interested in that and I'm curious to see if Mel is going to hook back up with Keith and give him any more insight into the phenomena of the poster. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice. Uh, but yeah, guys, let me know what you thought of these three chapters, what you think of the book so far, if you enjoyed my uh, portrayal of Mel, and uh, let me hear some of your predictions. If you've already read the book, no spoilers, 
But if you haven't read the book like me, this is my first time as I'm narrating it. It's my first time reading it. Then hit us up with some predictions. Let's see if any of us get it right. And I'll be back very soon with more of Freddy Krueger's Tales of Terror, Virtual Terror, by David Bergantino. Thanks for a great book, David. Really enjoying this one. And, uh, yeah, everybody, have a great night. Be excellent to each other. Do good. And as always, pleasant dreams! We'll see you next time.